class, Professor Cook here. I am back with part three of our class and lecture on social control and deviance. So I'm going to jump right into talking about some um, theoretical perspectives on crime and deviance. And you can also look at your chapters, your chapter six, roughly pages, uh, 214 and on. They cover some of these um, theoretical perspectives. So starting with the functionalist perspective, um, I want to just kind of touch back on what functionalism is. It's again that macro level theory that talks about what, how different institutions in society function to help uh, society work and or to help individuals in society. So from a functionalist perspective, in some ways deviance and crime are considered normal, not necessarily desirable, but sort of normal and can be functional. Um, they can be functional in that uh, they can affirm cultural norms and values, um, provide temporary safety valves, to some extent create unity, improve the uh, economy, such as a prison or a, a large institution coming to town like that, and they can trigger social change. So I feel like hopefully these are fairly self-explanatory. I want to go back for a minute and talk about the disc functions of crime and deviance because, of course, we, we think about these much more commonly than we do think about the functions. Um, definitely, if you feel that there's a lot of crime going on, it can make you feel anxious and, and have less trust in relationships with other people and less confidence in institutions like the criminal justice institution. And also crime and deviance are very costly, both in terms of um, what they cost society economically and, of course, in terms of human, human lives and um, injuries. Okay, so functional, just to touch on that again, um, crime and deviance help us actually affirm or review or renew what we think of as our values and our norms. So in when we have in-person class, sometimes we talk about Lance Armstrong, the famous cyclist, um, in this context, and we talk about how he was um, accused for many years of doping, of blood doping and cheating in cycling, and he denied it and denied it, and how he finally admitted it, um, and then was punished by being stripped of his titles and his gold medals, and we talk about whether her, whether or not his behavior was deviant or criminal. Um, I make the argument that it was both, and we can talk about that or you can think about that if you'd like. Um, but the point of punishing Armstrong so harshly as an example, right, by stripping him of all of his um, financial means associated with cycling and banning him from cycling is to say not only do we not want you to cheat, but if you lie about it, that's that's a, another um, level of norms and values violation that society feels like we need to punish really strongly. Okay, so coming back to Durkheim and functionalism, Durkheim said that a lot of deviance could come from this concept of anomie. So this is pronounced anomie. Um, anomie is a condition in which people are not sure how to behave because norms are absent or conflicting or confusing. Um, so they don't change quickly enough or you're unsure how to act or you feel, um, honestly, a lot of us might be feeling a bit of anomie right now because of the, the change in social isolation and everyday patterns of behavior affected by the coronavirus. Um, and we're confused sometimes about norms, like what, what are we supposed to be doing? Should we be going outside? Should we not? Right. Um, they've been fairly clear about this, but uh, in the beginning of this this social isolation time, they were there was kind of mixed messaging happening, right? And change was going really quickly, and all of us had to sort of figure out what class was going to look like, etc. Okay, so anomie is describing um, it, I, it's not depression, but it's I think it definitely has the implication of having. Um, personal angst and personal anxiety and depression and not feeling connected to society um, because of confusing or conflicting norms. Okay, um, 
Moving on, anime was important to touch on, but I want to spend a little more time talking about Merton's strain theory. Okay, so Merton picks up from Durkheim on this concept of anime. So before I get into strain theory, I want to discuss how sociologists and how social, how psychologists, excuse me, tended to understand deviance prior to the 1950s and prior to Merton's um, strain theory. They tended to see uh, especially civil disobedience, like social movements, as some kind of mental disorder. And they, they were quite negative in terms of stereotyping and stigmatizing people who were deviant um, and wanted to locate that source of deviance as some sort of problem in the individual, like sociopathic or psychopathic. And I'm, I'm not saying that sociopaths and psychopaths don't exist, not at all, but to add to the discipline's understanding of deviance and crime, I think Merton's uh, social strain theory really helps because it makes the argument that taking the value judgment out of deviance and crime, it actually makes sense in some context that we would, when we're experiencing anime, behave in ways that are deviant, right? So... All of that is to say, in the past, the way deviance was viewed was very negative and stereotyping of the individual who committed the deviant act. And after Durkheim and then Merton, deviance started to be put in a context um, that it was sort of a product of society's pressure that it put on individuals. So strain theory uh, by Merton here means that an individual, or he's saying an individual, feels some kind of strain or pressure uh, put on them by society, and there's a conflict between their goals and their means that society has um, socialized them to want or have access to. Okay, I think this will make sense in a minute. And again, we're not talking about extreme violent situations or serial killers or something like that. In this context, we're talking about sort of more of the average um, everyday sort of deviance. Okay, these are important for you to know and understand. I definitely will be asking you to recognize these on the exam, and I'll definitely be asking you to um, apply the correct term to an example. So I'm going to try to explain this clearly. The thing to ask yourself when you're trying to decide which adaptation to strain we're talking about is what is the individual's goal in this situation and what are the means that they have to achieve that goal, okay? So as your book says, and as Merton said, most of us are not deviant from this perspective. This does not mean we don't break the rules sometimes and run a red light or drive too fast or whatever. That's not what we're saying here. Merton is saying overall, we tend to be conformists. Society tells us, you know, messages like to have a good life, you should go to college and work hard and save money and then accomplish the goal you want of a home or family or fancy car or vacation or whatever, what have you. So in that, in that situation, I guess I'm thinking about vacation a lot right now. I think we would all like to go somewhere other than our house. Um, okay, so... Um, the goal here would be a socially accepted goal of having a good job and a, maybe, let's say, a home, being a homeowner. And the means are also socially approved that I walk through. If you're a conformist, you um, go to college, get a good job, save money, right? So socially accepted goals and socially accepted means. If those line up, that person is not being deviant. They are conformist. Okay. Where, where it gets interesting is when there is uh, something different there in the goals and the means. Okay, so for Merton, if an individual so accepts the goals that society tells them they should have, but they reject the means or don't have access to them, so they use other means that are not, um, that are not appropriate by, deemed appropriate by society, that person is an innovator. Okay. So the example might be, um, I want, I know I need to have a college degree, right, to get a job, but instead of working for it, maybe I pay someone to print me a counterfeit degree. That person would be an innovator, okay? 
A ritualist is a person who rejects the goals of society but accepts the means. This one's a little tricky for people to understand, but I always think of the character Stanley from The Office. I don't know if he rejects the goal because his goal is retirement, but he's really it's really clear that Stanley does not care uh, about the quality of his work or he's too demoralized to really you know put much effort into into his work and he's sort of just waiting out the days until he's he gets his retirement. So again, a ritualist uh, rejects the goal but accepts the means. In your book, they talk about um, individuals who, who maybe uh, don't buy the home or don't have a family, but they still go to work and kind of kind of go through the motions, right? They um, they don't necessarily internalize those socially approved goals, but they they aren't out there causing crime and and being um, being deviant and disruptive. Okay, a retreatist is a person who rejects goals and means and maybe goes to live in the woods or off the grid or really changes uh, their lifestyle dramatically. A retreatist is not a rebel. That's where people get confused. So the difference for Merton in these definitions between a retreatist and a rebel or retreatism and rebellion is a retreatist is like, I'm leaving. I don't care what the rest of you do, but I'm not going to work nine to five and just to buy a big house and have a mortgage um, for the rest of my life, right? A retreatist is, I'm going to go live in a van uh, down by the river. And for those of you who get that from Saturday Night Live 20 years ago, 25 years ago, congrats, um, right? A rebel, on the other hand, wants to change society for everybody. So a rebel like uh, Che Guevara, who is uh, mentioned in your textbook, wants to replace capitalism with socialism, um, really wants to dramatic, dramatically change our social structure. You might make the argument that candidate and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, you could kind of consider that person a rebel, but he's doing it through a really socially accepted goal of running for Senate, being in government, and running for president. I mean, I know he has dropped out at this point, but I'm not sure if I would put him in the rebel place. If he if he refused to run for president and said, I think we should seize the means of production from the capitalists and um, overthrow the government, etc., that, that might be a different, a different um, categorization for him. Okay. Conformist, innovator, ritualist, retreatist, rebel. Make sure you understand stand those. And just to have a little practice um, for you, here is here are some examples. So just read through these and see if you get them um, correct. Hopefully they make sense. The last one on this slide is a little bit tricky because it says a man uses his employer's equipment and supplies when starting his own business. I think that you need just a little bit more information on this one. If the man does not have permission to use his employers and equipment, that person is an innovator. If the person does have permission, like let's say it's his father's business and he wants to kind of um, step out on his own, but he has his dad's permission, then he's a conformist. Okay, so that last one is just slightly tricky if you don't have a little more information. I would not be quite that tricky on an exam, okay? I just want to make sure um, that you know that. Oh, I guess we forgot to put the, the answers in the slides. Okay, so I'm going to say the answers next. So pause it if you want to practice on your own. And coming back, the answers are innovator, adult walks off his job and leaves town without his family, retreatist, he's rejecting both the goal of supporting his family and the means, his job. And then this one, as I said, a man uses his employer's equipment, could be an innovator. The goal of starting your own business is socially approved, but using someone else's equipment and supplies without their permission is not approved. So that would be innovation. However, if he has permission, again, then that's a conformist because there's not deviance in either the goals or the means. Okay, moving forward, so the most important things to remember uh, in terms of functionalist perspectives on crime and deviance are considering um, 
considering anomy and considering the whole idea of adaptations to strain, gaps between goals and means as a reason and a typology for deviance, if you will. This is Bernie Madoff. Uh, if you don't know who he is, he's talked about briefly in your textbook um, and gets us into conflict theory perspectives on crime and deviance. So remember that conflict theory is based on Marx and Karl Marx and Marxism um, and kind of looks at why are some, are some laws so punitive and why are we so focused on some kinds of deviance and not others. So of course, for conflict theorists, the focus is always how do elites maintain control of the rest of us by manipulating the law or through financial uh, means of manipulation, okay? So um, powerful groups tend to control the law and its application. Um, you can think about how when a corporation messes up and causes society a lot of financial or physical harm um, to individuals, usually the heads of the corporation do not go to prison, right? The corporation might have to pay fines and et cetera, but usually the people in charge, the CEO, don't go to prison. Bernie Madoff was on your slides here because he represents a certain kind of white collar crime. Um, and what is frustrating about some of this that we would consider to be inappropriate is that it's actually legal. Um, okay, if you are interested, you can watch this is a video link called Hot Coffee. It's a really interesting uh, New York Times retro report about the woman who in the 90s, she spilled coffee and was burned pretty severely. And she sued McDonald's and has kind of become a shorthand to speak to, you know, unnecessary lawsuits. But this video, I'm going to warn you, has some graphic content. And it, it certainly shows parts of this story that I didn't know. And it kind of, again, goes back to that whole concept that we, we have in our um, video homework this week with the two boys and their joy rides um, of the media shaping the construction of deviance. So, um, I'll let you watch that if you're interested. I'm going to say a couple things about it now. Uh, spoiler alert, so you can skip 30 seconds if, uh, if you don't want to know before you watch it or pause it, watch it, and come back. What is interesting about this is if we look at Stella Liebeck, who was the victim in this case um, of burning herself, she has been constructed as the villain, right? And conflict theorists would say that's all about McDonald's having the amount of power that it does and the media kind of playing into McDonald's' hands and shaping the narrative the way that they did. Um, because, again, kind of going back to what we just talked about with adaptations to strain, Liebeck uh, was hurt, was hurt by a corporation, and if you are hurt by a corporation, the socially approved or accepted way of uh, seeking retribution is to sue them in our country. It is not to go to McDonald's and throw a brick through their window, right? So she was actually following um, what she was supposed to do, quote unquote, supposed to do, if she felt like she was wronged by a corporation by taking them to court. The jury um, awarding her such a large settlement uh, was, an, was an unexpected um, result of that. So you can watch that if you're interested, but I think it really fits with this perspective on how corporations um, have such a, a high regard and role and undue power and influence, uh, some would argue in this country, that they get to kind of, even in legal contexts, shape the narrative. Okay. White collar crime is not these two handsome dudes on a TV show, <laughs> although it was it was about white collar crime, I guess. I've only seen a couple of those. Um, white collar crime is different from what we would consider violent crime or vice crime in that it is committed by high status people in the course of their occupation. So you can think about um, the Bernie Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme, you can think about Enron, um, Martha Stewart, and her insider trading. Uh, Y'all, I think, were quite young when this happened, but she went to prison, 
for insider trading for a year-ish, maybe not quite. Um, so within the kind of category of white collar crime, you can have different types. Corporate crime is illegal activities committed by executives to benefit themselves and their companies. So again, corporate crime is also kind of benefiting the company. One example of this is um, the car manufacturer, manufacturer uh, Volkswagen. They got in trouble and were sued and had to make restitution a couple of years ago because they lied about their emissions standards and, and they made their emissions rates look better for the environment than they were and they knew about this and they lied about this to benefit the company, right? So people knew about it and tried to um, raise awareness, but it benefited the company, so they, they had an incentive to lie about it to keep their jobs. Wells Fargo, uh, the banking institution, got into some trouble in this category because they were pressuring um, loan officers to open accounts, and so people would say, I didn't even open this account. Um, who banked at Wells Fargo because the the um, loan officers uh, were pressured to like open accounts and they even found accounts in like dogs names and pets names and cats names. It was ridiculous to benefit the, the company. Okay, the last uh, theory I want to talk about today is symbolic interactionism and symbolic interactionists say that uh, rather than the micro or excuse me, let me back up. Rather than the macro level of functionalists and conflict theorists um, that look at sort of larger social structures and, and, and relationships between institutions that lead to deviance or lead to the defining of deviance, symbolic interactionism looks at the individual. And the biggest, I would say their, their largest orienting idea here is that deviance is learned. Deviance is learned through interaction. So one um, example of this is differential associations theory. Basically, this is a fancy way of saying uh, you are influenced by the people around you. Not, it's not specifically peer pressure as a concept, but it's basically saying if you grow up in a context that does not see um, drug use as a problem, you, you also are not going to see drug use as deviant, right? If you grow up thinking it's appropriate to drink and smoke um, and smoke marijuana, that you are also going to learn those values. So differential associations. Um, I always think of the TV show Shameless when we're talking about this because I think it's a great example of this theory. So if you've not seen this show, uh, that's okay. You don't have to watch it. So in the, I've only seen some of the U.S. version, but I remember an episode where in the, um, in the neighborhood, a, a meat truck, like a refrigerated meat truck, breaks down. And the driver of the truck goes to the bar where the main characters hang out and asks for help. Uh, for some reason, he doesn't have a cell phone. I don't know. And so they send this guy on basically a wild goose chase. And then everyone in the neighborhood comes out and strips and steals all the meat from the truck by the time the guy gets back to it. And they're hiding it and they're cutting it up and they're trying to figure out, you know, what to do with it. And um, it just, to me, it really illustrates this because the people who are participating in this group act of neighborhood deviance, they're not thinking of it as stealing, they're thinking of it like sort of like winning the lottery, right? Like, oh, this truck broke down. Of course we would do this. Of course we would. This is just how you get by in this neighborhood. So very different um, construction of those values. Another important concept to add here, and this goes back if you have not watched the videos of the two boys um, taking cars on joy rides, now is the time to go watch that and then come back. Um, because labeling theory, I think, really applies to those situations. And I'm going to reference those two examples um, as I explain labeling theory. Labeling theory essentially is picking up on that symbolic interactionist concept of interactions, creating meaning around the deviance. So the primary deviance here would be the initial 
deviant act, the violation, the law breaking, and then there's an interaction about that that creates meaning and possibly some internalization of labels for the individual. And then secondary deviance occurs after that. So an example that we might think about is, um, let's say when you're a young person, you this is common, you know, kids might shoplift, right? And so the first act of deviance is possibly the, the kid shoplifting, and they get caught and they get labeled a criminal and a juvenile delinquent and all these really negative terms, um, and they're judged really harshly and very punitively. Instead of um, kind of letting go of that, the child or the person may internalize that label and start to think of themselves in, in that way, um, in that way, and then that label kind of becomes part of their identity. So then the secondary deviance occurs after that. So you can possibly think of someone that you knew growing up, growing up um, who was labeled this way and then kind of leaned into that, if you will, and decided, well, if you're going to call me, you know, a deviant, then I'm really going to be a troublemaker. I'm really going to be deviant. Um, so back to the joyriding examples from the, the two boys that we, that we looked at, hopefully you looked at, you can think about the difference in the words that are used to describe Preston, the first child, um, who was on the Today Show for doing this. And I know he didn't run into things and cause damage. Uh, Preston is described as kind of an every kid, like, uh, oh, any kid could do this. You never know. They just, he just had a, a wild hair or he had a, he had a random idea and he did something naughty, right? His cotton candy everyday kid. You can think about that versus the way that Latarian was described in the second video. Latarian, at even in that video at age seven, has already internalized some labels, right? He says he says he wanted to do bad stuff, like it's fun to do bad stuff. And so he has not had the benefit of what I assume was some impression management coaching by Preston's parents before being on the Today Show, right? He Latarian is just reacting, and I honestly don't think it's legal to be showing him on TV without permission from his parents or guardian. Um, I know that he was featured on some other popular culture shows, and I, so I'm aware of that, and I think he recently did get into um, some more trouble as an adult. So you can kind of think about labeling theory in the context of those two kids and whether or not um, that same thing would have happened for Latarian had he had a different reaction to that that initial act of deviance. I know the situations were different. I know Latarian caused um, property damage, uh, etc. So I, I'm aware of that. But just consider this theory in in those examples. Okay. So moving on, um, just a couple of more concepts here. The criminal justice system is referring to police, courts, prisons. We can we can ask ourselves whether or not our goal with the criminal justice system is prevention and intervention or punishment and rehabilitation. We've discussed some of the ways that um, while we would hopefully be preventing crime and deviance, we end up being quite punitive. There's a pretty interesting discussion in your book at the end about the death penalty and how that is not applied in, a, in an equal way uh, in the United States. You're far more likely to be sentenced uh, to death if you meet certain criteria than others, and it doesn't have to do necessarily with the nature of your crime. Um, I just read a book about this too, which was pretty interesting, but moving on, I did want to talk about this slide because it's, it's really illustrative of a concept uh, uh, called recidivism. Okay, so I want to explain this for a minute. Before I do that, recidivism is the t tendency for someone who has been incarcerated to be released and then reoffend or recommit a crime. In the United States, as I mentioned in the last lecture portion, we have a very high rate of incarceration and we have a very high rate of recidivism. The statistic is something like after 
being released, something like 80% of all people who were incarcerated end up recidivating or re recommitting a felony. And so we might want to ask ourselves, okay, if prison is our go-to, if incarceration is our go-to punishment as a society to try to reduce and prevent crime, but we have this very high rate of recidivism, it's obviously not working, right? It's not working in terms of a crime prevention. Of course, it prevents that particular individual from recidivating while they are incarcerated. But if the goal is to have them go back into society and be be productive and functional, that's not happening. Okay. So sociologist Diva Pager wanted to understand why that was. Uh, she I don't I did not know her personally, but she also went to the University of Wisconsin. So I certainly um, was aware of who she was and read her articles, and she's a, she was a brilliant um, sociologist. Unfortunately, she passed away last year, and it's a real loss um, to, to everybody. She's a great scholar. Um, so Pager, for her, I think this was for her dissertation work in Wisconsin, set up a quasi-experiment. And she took um, two matched pairs of young men. Okay, and she sent them out to look for jobs. Okay, so she designed her experiment where she had four young men, two were black, two were white, and she gave them fake resumes and told them to go apply for jobs. The resumes between the two men, between all of them, were the same, except in each of the pairs, one of the resumes had had an indicator on it that that person had a criminal background, had a criminal record, and the other one did not. Okay. So the independent variables here were race of the individual applying for the job and whether or not they had a faked criminal record. Neither, these were all actors. None of them actually had a criminal record. Pager also randomized within the pairs who had the record and who didn't to try to control for any effects of one person just being more well-spoken or charming or handsome or something because we know those things actually affect um, callbacks for jobs as well. So... What she found was depressing, frustrating, but not too surprising. Um, she sent these individuals out to apply for jobs. And out of all of the applications, 34% of white men without a criminal record were called back. Okay. So it's not surprising that people without criminal records would be called back more than people with criminal records. What is surprising and frustrating and um, very troubling is that white men with a criminal record were called back at a higher rate than black men without a criminal record. Okay, let's say that again. What this is showing us is white men with a criminal record were called back more often than black men without a criminal record. This is showing there's evidence here that the out, what you can conclude from this is that both the status of the individual and the race interact to produce a different kind of discrimination. Okay. So yes, people showed bias in favor of people without a criminal record, but this bias was also racialized. Why am I talking about this in the context of recidivism and reoffending? Um, because if you can't get a job after you're released, it's pretty difficult to support yourself. There are a lot of benefits that are prohibited for you once you have a felony um, record. So not getting a job is not going to help anyone. And then if this is if this is conditioned by the individual's race, that's concerning as well. Uh, by the way, people had critiques of this because she only had black and white individuals. She um, teamed up with others and did a larger version of this study that included um, Latino matched pair of people, and she saw a really similar result with um, Latinos receiving callbacks somewhere in the middle of the white and black applicants' rates of callback. Okay. So this is just food for thought about prison and, and the punishment for crime violation in our country, and there's a lot more good stuff in your chapter. I'm going to stop here and talk to you soon. Thanks.